So welcome to my second podcast. Uh, this took a little bit longer than planned to do, but it was, uh, I felt it was really important to finally get around doing, and I've had the opportunity to work with Christian in Lisbon, and of course, over the past four years as well, and uh, I was uh, 100% committed to getting Christian as my, uh, my second person to interview, to allow you guys to kind of get an idea more of the coaches that I work with and the uh, the kind of coaches that are out there that can really give you the support that you need in dating and really make a difference for your life. So if anything, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to Lisbon. I know obviously it was for work, but um, my pleasure. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, so I think what I'd love to be able to start off with first is to get an idea for for the guys watching like how things all started for you so take me back uh, I suppose prior to four years ago uh, before you got into the realm of doing pickup and day game and the likes Mm -hmm. um, what were you like growing up yeah um I mean, I would say my journey started when I was brought up in the Lake District, yeah, so I was brought up in a single parent household in the Lake District, I didn't have a stable father a father figure growing up, um, so it was just me and my mum, so my mum worked multiple jobs so she, she could support us, I didn't have that masculine influence in my life, um, and yeah, I think that definitely had an impact on me. I definitely struggled socially growing up. I think most children do. Mm. I think there's, there's, there's no rule book on how to be a child, how to make friends. Um, when you're that age, so you don't know what you don't know, but I don't know, I always, I always, I always saw myself as being separate to the children. I would spend time in the playground, I'd see other children interacting with other children, and I would always have this resistance towards doing that. I always felt like there was something wrong with me. Like, how, how is it so effortless for these children and it's so difficult for me? And like, I'd spend most of the time on my own. I'd walk around the playground on my own. Uh, I would like go to the toilets during like, like in primary school, you get those like 15 minute breaks. I didn't want to be in the playground because like, oh, I'm not gonna be able to speak to anybody. It's gonna, it's gonna feel awkward. So I think that was me experiencing social anxiety early on in my life. Mm. And then that continued, cause I'm an only child as well. So I didn't have any like brothers, sisters, like siblings to sort of like bounce off and to, to play with. So I would say it's quite an isolated existence growing up. And then that happened until about 13 years old. And then when I got to 13, I saw David Blaine, you know, the magician guy. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I saw him on YouTube performing magic for some hillbillies. I was like, that was quite fun. I feel as though like that could be a good way for me to like interact with the world. Because I felt on my own, I wasn't good enough to talk to the world. Mm. But I felt as though if I had this, if I had this cool skill like magic, then maybe people would would want to listen to me. Yeah. People would maybe people would want to be my friend. Maybe people would actually love me. That's how, how old were you at, at that point? Thirteen. Okay. Yeah. Right, so, so, so I don't yeah, think I was. Really I don't young. think I was thinking these things consciously. But I think like by seeing David Blaine perform magic, I could mm. see the validation and the approval that he was getting from strangers. So like, I think my 13 year old mind was like, this is a way for us to receive love in some way. So that kick started my journey. So I was just binge watching magic content for about two months. It's quite similar to Cole Approach. I think like, guys stumble across it, then they start watching the videos. And then I think if, if somebody is starting to watch those videos. The part of them that actually wants to go out there and take action. That's what it was for me when I was watching, when I was watching the magic videos. And then <clears throat> I remember uh, like two months after I was watching the magic videos, I bought like a, pl- a pack of p- a playing cards, which I was like practicing with in my room on my own. And then two months after watching like David Blaine, I was like, okay, I'll go outside. I'll, I'll try and do this thing. Mm. And it was like the scariest thing ever. Like I realized that what, what was the trick that you, uh, you first learned and then demoed in front of people? Well, that, well, that, that was a problem. Like, I, wasn't, I wasn't able to perform to start off with. Okay. So it's like, that's the whole thing. It's like with, with magic, it's not, it's not so much about the tricks that you're learning. It's mm. about who you are. It's like Robbie Williams isn't the best singer in the world, but he's an amazing entertainer. Mm. So it's like, it's, just, it's actually just like developing the self-belief that you can actually go over to people. That was what I struggled with the most. But anyway, it took me about two months. Um, 
I tried going out there, approaching people, and then eventually I plucked up the courage. I mean, I used to go around parks in the Lake District because the parks I found were easier. I couldn't go to like the really busy streets. So I used to go around parks. I, I found this like woman who was sat down on the bench. I was like, hi, can I show you something cool with cards? And she's like, yeah, okay. So I did this like trick where like she picks a card and the card that she picks, it ends up in my mouth. Like, it, it's cool, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a cool trick. But like, just like at 13 years old, it's like, I don't know, I feel like it's, it's not a normal thing to want to do. You know, like it's not a normal thing to want to go out there and put yourself through the social fire, risking getting rejected. It's just, I would walk around like the parks in the Lake District, I'd have a deck of cards in my hand, felt like I was walking around with this dirty secret. I was like, oh, what are people going to think of me if they see me carrying a pack of playing cards? Well, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of developed over time and I was like, oh, fuck it, I just got to do but one. interesting that you had the insecurity of having just a pack of playing cards in your pocket, mm. even though you were learning to be a magician at the time well i don't i don't know i don't, I don't think i don't think that that is that um um strange because like the point being is like I, i've got severe social anxiety at this mm. point okay so like i've got zero belief in myself whatsoever like I, i'm i'm just so castrated of confidence and it's like because like for me as well like magic is still this weird thing as well I'm like, oh, like, do people even like magic in the UK? Like, am I going to be uh, received that well? So, I don't know. I think I was just a very, like, I was an overthinker, like a chronic overthinker as a child. And, yeah, I think, I, yeah, I, I struggle socially, but through magic, I was able to find more of a voice to myself. And then once I started getting good at magic over the years, like, I started getting paid. I started performing at bars and restaurants, and people started to know about me or Christian he's a yeah he can perform magic and yeah it's satiated I think a deep need inside of me to feel important mm. and did that happen before you went to uni or was that kind of like in parallel when you did like the uni thing yeah so I mean I, I've been I've been doing magic since 13 <clears throat> and then yeah doing like the the like restaurants and stuff so yeah I was I was performing magic for about like four or five years and then I went to university at 18 in Liverpool um, and then I was performing around like one of the main social areas in the city, it's called Concert Square um, and yeah like it, it was nice, I, I saw like me going to university it was an opportunity to reinvent myself, mm. nobody knew me in Liverpool, I knew that I needed to get out of my small town so being brought up in the Lake District is a small town, it's called Barrow in Furness, it's about 60,000 people there. Um, wow, okay. And pretty, it's that small, pretty small then. Yeah, it's a small town crabs in a bucket mentality. So I don't have the best of relationships with most people in my family because I was the only person in our family who decided not to go down the traditional route. So in the Lake District, there's a big submarine factory. It's called BAE Systems. All my family work in that submarine factory. It's like my dad works there, my granddad worked there, like his dad worked there, like everyone. You, you, you go to school and you go to some marine factory. And if you dare decide to go against that grain, then there's gonna be problems. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's tough for a child. Like to, the, in, in, the, in the few conversations that I did have with my dad, it was always a case of, right, when you get to 16, you go into the shipyard. That's what we call it, it's like the yard. You yeah. go into the shipyard and then yeah. you stay there, you know, you fucking like get married, and have a, get a mortgage, have a, few children and it's just the same cycle rinse and repeat mm. but I just knew early on I've got my mum to thank a lot for that as well because my mum installed it into me very early that you can do whatever you want to do like as soon as I said to my mum I want, I, want, I want to become a magician like whatever I said to my mum oh I want to at one point I wanted to be a football manager then I wanted to be a magician then at one point I wanted to run a lemonade stand outside of our house every every idea that I gave to her she just said yeah you can do that yeah you'd, you'd be really good at that so I think I owe a lot to that irrational faith in my own ability to my mum, mm -hmm. because if I, if I gave that information to my dad, he'd be like, what are you talking about? You can't do that. Like, you need to go, you need to go into the shipyard. That's, that's all you're worth. That's the, the message, like the underlying message. But my mum was different. Like, but my mum was like, well, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. You could probably do that. So, but yeah, it's, it's, it's weird. I think people listen to this, if, if you've been brought up into that household where maybe you've got a lot of pressure from your family, like they want to they wanna mold you in a certain way, you can actually say no to, to your family. And I know it's difficult for most people because mm. I think family ties are the strongest ties. But I think that 
I think it only takes one family member to give you that belief that you could actually do something different. I think that's important. But yeah, I think I, I do understand that if people have got pressure from the family, it is difficult to go against the grain. But yeah. I think ultimately it's like, well, what life do you want to live? Like, I think I had a mature mindset for my age because I, I projected 50 years into the future. And I was like, I don't want to be waking up to go to that submarine factory when I'm 68 years old, like, fuck that. Mm. So I think, yeah, I, I'm, I'm grateful to that younger version of myself, even though I was a sniveling mess who didn't know a lot. I think I did know myself well at an early age. And I'm grateful that my mum had the, had the foresight to be able to install belief inside of me young. But it sounds like even at a young age, you had that drive to wanting to, uh, to, wanting to do something different and do something that was going to make you happy. However difficult and challenging, because even I can relate to, you know, being in a family where they wanted just certain things for me and how anything that I was doing, however successful I was being, it just wasn't good enough for them. Mm -hmm. it, wasn't hap uh, it wasn't appealing for them. And yet with my brother, it was always a slightly different story. If he was doing that a little bit better, they would praise him all that. And then maybe it might be different because of just having, having a sibling, but um, there's certainly, I think, a bit more rivalry when you've, you've got siblings. And then as much as parents say that, you know, they haven't got their favorite child and, and whatnot, mm. uh, there is certainly, I think, a comparison that that does play out there. But I, I think it's great, though, that at least, you know, your mum has been incredibly supportive for you. Um, I mean, I've known guys over the years and even coaches whose families just were never that, that supportive at all. Like literally everyone in the family was against them and they had to kind of do what they could to prove um, that they were trying to do good, that they were trying to genuinely help people. So I think it's pretty admirable to go against the grain, to have chosen not to have done something that sounds very generational uh, in your family, to have gone and worked in a submarine thing, um, and then to, to do something different and doing not the, sub, uh, not doing the submarine thing, doing the, uh, the magic stuff. And then what, what did you study at uni then, if, as you went to uni? English literature. Oh wow, okay, yeah. very, very different. Well, I always, I always, I always liked reading. I always, I've always enjoyed books, I've always enjoyed language. Yeah. I think language was probably my first love. Like, I always loved the way that people were That's able- That's why you're just so articulate with, <laughs> and you're able to bring up some Shakespearean points of view when you're- That's in your it. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I don't know, I've always, I've always liked the way that language is used to express ideas and yeah, I don't know, I think I just always had a call into more of the uh, like artistic creative side of life. Um, but yeah, like, yeah I, I, enjoyed, I enjoyed the like, language. Interesting. Okay, so, so changing the topic just slightly, when did you have your first relationship and what was that like? So my first relationship came when I went to university. Okay. Yeah, so I mean... Yeah, because that, that's where I was curious about it, because you're obviously trying to build your confidence with, with the magic stuff from like being 13. Mm -hmm. um, and it sounded like that there probably wasn't any relationship stuff going on until maybe a bit later. Yeah. Yeah, no, I didn't have any romantic interest for the first 18 years of my life. That was always an area that I struggled with. I mean, the two areas which I struggled with the most growing up was so social skills and relationships, which is quite ironic now. But I think, I, I do think that was necessary. Like, I do think that having such a lack created that drive. It's like, you know, like child actors, mm. you know, like if you get given so much fame so early you can go to your head and you can stop trying. Yeah. I think because I came from a place of scarcity rather than abundance in regards to social and romantic interests. I don't know, I feel as though I've always had that chip on my shoulder to want to be able to like prove to myself and the world that, oh, I am worthy of being able to receive love and validation, approval. But yeah, the first relationship, yeah, it came at 18. So I went to university. A couple of months after starting university, I met a girl at a house party. And then, yeah, she became my first girlfriend. She was a girl that, she was basically my first everything. Well, she wasn't my first kiss, but yeah, she was a girl that I lost my virginity to. Um, she was like my first girlfriend. She was my first, I love you. And we were, we were together about 18 months. Mm. Um, and I mean, yeah, to this day, I think I'm still so surprised I actually managed to get into a relationship with this girl because she was absolutely stunning. 
and I used to like like bring her over to my student accommodation. My friends would look at her, and she and then they'd like look at her in comparison to me because like I was really ugly for most of like my like early adult life. And like they would look at me and look at her and be like, "How did you get her? Yeah. How did you actually get her?" But I think the the way that I got her was because I actually. I, I, I was playing the game, if you want to call it that. I was playing the game more, more excited to win than I was scared to lose. Mm. So I felt as though I didn't actually have anything to lose. Like I felt, okay, I'm so ugly right now. I've got no money. I've got very little value in my life. Yeah, I can do magic, but like no one really cares that much. So I was like, well, I can just go and approach people. And like, you know, like the first time I approached it, I was telling her like, oh, I've got freshers flu. I can't stop shitting myself. <laughs> then, we had a th then we had a thumb war. And then like things, things worked out well, but like I've always yeah. got respect for that, that that former version of me. Like sometimes I wish that I could tap into him a little bit more mm. because like he was super carefree. I think like the older I've got, the more responsibility I've developed. I think it's like I don't know. I think it's quite difficult for me to tap like to truly tap back into that energy because like at 18, I did my first solo skydive. Yeah, so it's like a weekend course, jumped out of a plane and did it twice. I would never do that anymore because now I feel as though I've actually got shit to lose. At 18, it's like I was just playing life like I was reckless. I didn't have anything to lose. But like that's the way that I was able to get her. I was like, I've got nothing to lose right now. I might as well go and like, you know, talk to her. Oh, I'm shitting myself. That's nice. Yeah. But yeah, that was my first girlfriend. That was my first relationship. But it, it became a relationship of codependency. I okay. think like a lot of relationships. As in you were very reliant on her in the relationship. Yeah, well, we became a lot, we became dependent on each other, but okay. it was definitely more of a my, me problem than a her problem because it was my first relationship. It was the first time that I found a girl who accepted me for who I was rather, mm. rather than what I had. Um, because it was like, it just felt this novelty. It felt like, I don't know, it felt like striking gold for the first time. So I was, I was scared of losing her. So I lost myself in that relationship. I stopped. I stopped go, like going to the gym. I stopped working on myself. My studies went to shit. I think I. I think I probably went to about two lectures in the whole of my first year. It's like I mean, first year didn't really matter. I mean, the whole of uni anyway. Don't matter. But yeah, I didn't. I didn't really apply myself that well. It was just like girlfriend, girlfriend, girlfriend. Yeah. Um, so she just became what the the main focus almost of yeah. your time at uni. Okay. Yeah. She became my entire reason for being. I put all my eggs into one basket, and then when that relationship inevitably blew up in my face. I didn't, I didn't really know where to turn to. Like that was one of the, the rock bottom moments of my life where I felt as though I had everything that I thought I wanted and then that turned to dust. And it was like, like where do I go from here? Um, but I do think that th those moments in a man's life where you feel as though you've lost everything, I feel as though they're rites of passage. Like I think we need those. And like, I'm, I'm grateful that I experienced that early on in my life. Like. Something that I really distaste in the modern hinterland of the internet is the amount of nonsense which is given online to guys where it's like, ignore women until you're 35. Like stay, stay single until you've got your, you know, making, you're making your six figures, you've got your penthouse in Malibu, you've got your 10 out of 10 body. Are you talking about like the sexual marketplace? Uh, well, yeah, I'm just talking sort of about the, uh, more of the, like the, the red pill dogma, which is being brainwashed into the minds of young men, where it's just like, you know, just ignore women for, until you get to like your mid thirties. But it's yeah. like, for me, young men need to have their heart broken early on. I think that the best thing that can happen to a young man, which happened to me, was falling in love, falling in love with a girl of your dreams and then having that relationship blow up in your face because the lessons that I learned from that heartbreak, they've set me perfectly up to navigate relationships with the feminine later in life. Mm. So if I hadn't have had that experience at 18 and I'd have worked my bollocks off and got like all of the materialistic trophies and then at 35, I'd have found that girl and then she was like, soz me, I don't want you anymore. I, I think that's a dangerous position to be in. I think it's a dangerous position if you're, you're having your heart broken for the first time at 35 years old, after having acquired all the things that you thought yeah. were going to be able to bring you that nourishing love from the feminine, you know? Yeah. yeah, and I think even waiting that long as well, it's going to be even more devastating if, you're, if you've not dated for a very long time and then you're in your, your much older ages. Yeah, you and need, then you've been rejected or, or experienced something that then you think, oh, well, I've had my time now. I'm not going to, I mean, I'm, I'm older. I'm not going to find someone uh, ever again. And, uh, and I think then even people think about how they've missed out on opportunities as well. How did you then get into the interest of the world of pickup? Yeah, so it was, it was during the pandemic. I was living... Uh, 
I was living in Leeds at the time. Yeah. I was in a long... This was, I suppose, four years ago, so you would have been, what, like 22, 23, 23. right? 23. Yeah. Yeah, so I was living, uh, I was living in a two-bed apartment with my then-girlfriend. Uh, so this was a different girlfriend, not the one that I met. Was that 18. in the same apartment that I slept on the, the couch on? Nah. Different nah, apartment, different okay. Different apartment, yeah. Yeah, we used to live two floors above that one. Really? Yeah. Nah, so then after, same, same building, same but... Building. Okay. After after okay. after after I ended the relationship with her, I downsized because I didn't need two two bedrooms anymore. Uh, so I was, <laughs> you wouldn't have had to have the sofa then. Um, but no, I was. I'd I have was, had the floor instead. <laughs> yeah. Um, but no, I was I was living with her during the pandemic, and I, it was there, there was nothing wrong with this relationship. It was actually the perfect relationship. Like she was like an ideal girl. We had like amazing chemistry. Everything was really good. And then one day during the pandemic, I, just, I was just on YouTube and I came across a guy who was filming videos in Barcelona and it was him approaching women in Barcelona. So like, I was aware of like pickup content in the past, but I always turned my nose up at it because it always came across as like sleazy or like scripted or too gamey. Like, I just didn't like that. It, I don't know, there's just something about me which it, it didn't resonate with me until I saw this guy doing it in Barcelona and everything just felt very natural. It was just like, oh, this is a cool guy who's attractive and he seems to just be like walking around Barcelona taking in the sights and when he sees somebody who he finds interesting he can just go over to them mm. and then the more that I thought about it it's like that video like that video changed my life forever because it completely rewired my brain into what game actually is for me it's just a skill set that unlocks the world I think if every guy was honest with themselves every guy I believe wants to be able to go over to women who he finds attractive without needing 10 shots of Sambuca down him and just be able to be like, hey, excuse me, you look amazing. I think we've all got that ingrained into us biologically to just be able to, to ignite relationships with the feminine, right? I think it's a beautiful skill to have, but I think it gets tainted by the, 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 the wording and the terminology and like the, the culture surrounding it. Oh, you're a pickup artist. It's like, so I say to people, learn day game, don't become a day gamer. Yeah, I think you should learn this skill set it's changed my life forever but when i saw that video of the guy in barcelona just something clicked inside my brain and i was like i can do this because i had the magic background i knew i could approach so i was mm. like i i can do this and not only can i do it but i can become really good at it and i can most likely create a career out of it so mm. it's like just from that first video very much like when i first watched david blaine perform magic something snapped inside of me i was like i can do that and it's probably like the the words of my mum echoing in my ear, like, yeah, Christian, you can do that. Like, no problem, you can do that. So it's the same when I saw David Blaine, the same when I saw this guy in Barcelona. I was like, yeah, I can do that. And like, I'd already, I'd already future projected. Like, I'd already, I don't, like, even though I was in this, this apartment in Leeds, I was living with my girlfriend, I'd already future projected. Like, I'd already met the version of myself who's in Lisbon with you today. Like, I already saw the path in front of me. I was like, right, I just need to become so good at this skill. I need to create videos. I need to find somebody who's going to record me. Like, I already, I'd already seen the future mapped out in front of me. I'd already met this version of myself. So it's like, I already, I had my current state and I had my desired state. And then the gap in between that was just the actions that I needed to take. So I saw the video, the guy in Barcelona, something clicked inside of me. I was like, that's what I want to do now. So I remember I went on a walk around Leeds and I asked myself, I had a conversation with myself. I was like, do you realistically see yourself being with this, this girl, my current girlfriend at the time? Do you see yourself being with this girl for the rest of your life? And I, I immediately answered, no. The answer was no. So I went back, that like, same day, after having that conversation with myself, I sat down and I said, we're not gonna have a relationship anymore. Um, this is not something that I see going into the future and I don't wanna waste your time with it anymore. So that was a big deal for me because up to that point, the girlfriends that I had, they'd all broken up with me. Yeah. So like, I'd never been the one to actually, because I'd always been too scared. Like, if I found a girlfriend, I would like stick to her like sellotape. I'd be like, oh, you know, please like me, like, never leave me. So that, that was the first time in my life where I'd actually grown a set of balls and like did what I wanted rather than settling for what I thought I could get. But it was a really great relationship, which is why it was just interesting in my mind because I'm like, you know, we, we, ha we are getting all of our needs met here. You know, we're getting nourishing love from the feminine. We're thinking about like getting married. I've already met a family, they all like me. Mm. It was like just like fiercely cutting that cord in pursuit of something which I, didn't, I, I still didn't have full certainty in it. Like this was me really just jumping into the unknown. Like, I didn't know how it was gonna play out, but that's why like one of my mantras is run from comfort like your life depends on it. You know, I think in life we get to these crossroad moments where it's time to like take a left or take a right. Mm -hmm. I think if I took the left and stayed in that relationship, I don't know, maybe we'd have children together right now, but it's like, I wanted to go this way. I wanted to venture into the unknown because like, 
I just knew I had, I know, I felt as though I had a symphony to share with the world. I felt as I had so much potential to give, I knew that it couldn't, I couldn't have both. If, if, if I was gonna go all in with cold approach, I needed to sacrifice this relationship, but I didn't, I didn't have full certainty attached to it. Like, I didn't know what I didn't know, but like, that, that's how I define comfort. You knew being out of that relationship would, was better than, than staying in it. Yeah, exactly. But like, that's, that's how I define confidence. Like, confidence is optimism in the absence of certainty, right? So I, I, whenever I see videos online, oh, confidence is when you're certain. No, it's not. Confidence is optimism in the absence of certainty, meaning that I'm not fully certain right now, but I've got optimism. Like, I've got delusional optimism and I've got a rational faith in my own capabilities. And also I know myself. I know that when I find something that I really want to do, mm. and I apply myself to it, like it's it's it would be unreasonable for me not to succeed because I already had evidence. Like evidence has got the loudest voice, right? So I'd already had evidence. But like, okay, I went from being this socially anxious teenager in the Lake District who couldn't talk to anybody to actually making a career out of magic. So I was like, if if the 13 year old version of me could do that, then the 23 year old version of me can craft a career out of cold approach. So yeah, that's how it all kick started. It was like, right, get rid of relationship go all in with the cold approach. Uh, that's how I started. I started during the pandemic. Yeah, I started, all I knew when I started was social distancing, face masks, and I was parading around the pavements of Leeds trying to learn the skill set um, of cold approach. Yeah, because you got a little bit of practice in before you reached out to me, right? Yeah, I'd been doing it for about six months. Prior, prior to before uh, yeah. having the yeah, first so session I've been, with I've been doing Yeah, so I've been doing cold approach on my own for the first six months. So travel was, travel was restricted, so I couldn't go abroad at the time. Yep. Um, so, but I knew that I needed variety because Leeds is it's too small a city, even more, it's like zombie land during the pandemic. Mm. You know, you'd be lucky if you saw like five girls a day. So I was like, okay, realistically, I need to be able to go to different places. So before I met up with you, it was like, I went to, went to Cambridge. I did a, a few solo trips to London, Manchester, Liverpool, York, Newcastle, Glasgow, Edinburgh, like, this was all just me, just trying to like, just just get as many reps in as possible. Like, but it's like, I I was I was obsessive about it when I first started. It was yeah. like all all I wanted to do was cold approach, and it was the same when I started Magic. It was like I think that in order I think in order to become to become great at anything, I think you need to be obsessed about it. I think it, ne it needs to be like your only thing, like the only thing that matters in the world. It's like, all, all I was focused on was Cold Approach. I was watching Cold Approach videos. I was listening to Cold Approach podcasts. I was reading blogs about it. I was making my own little like day game diary videos. Like, oh, I've gone out today. Uh, the freshers are back. I've done like 20 approaches or like whatever. So it's like, it just became my entire reason for being. And I think that's one of the biggest mistakes I see with guys who are learning the skills. It's like, they want to half ass it, but it's like going halfway with half a heart only digs a deeper grave. So it's like, if you're going to do this, you have to go all in with it. Not for the rest of your life, but I think that just having an obsession period, it might be for 30 yeah, days, I, Well, days, I, I call days. it the sabbatical experience, where you are literally just taking time out from anything else, solely focusing on the thing, but making sure that you've got an exit strategy to it. Yeah, day game should not be the end game. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. And I think, yeah, for me, so I did that for six months. I was, you know, I was doing it all on my own, but then it was about four or five months into it where I just knew this was not going to be sustainable in the long run. I was like, okay, do I really want to be doing just this? Like just going out on my own, you know, talking with a few random guys in some internet for it just, it's not what I wanted. And also I knew that I still had a long way to go in terms of actually mastering the skill set. So then I, 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 I learned about you. And I learned about the, the service that you offered, which was getting filmed in London. Um, and I knew, like, I learned about your credibility in the industry. I knew you'd, you'd been doing it for like, I think about 13 or 14 years at that time, however long it would be. And I was like, yeah, I need this. In order for me to elevate, it was both from a cold approach perspective and a business perspective as well. Like I knew that I needed to start actually publishing high quality infield footage in Leeds. The, the videos are still available on my, on my channel. In Leeds, it was me and this uh, guy that I met on a day game wings forum. <laughs> I had a camera, he had a pair of shoulders. So like, he, like sometimes like, you know, camera, you know, it was like this. Yeah. But like when we didn't have the, uh, the strap on, um, he just like rested, <laughs> rested the guy. camera on a bin. That was our, that was our, you know, it was, it was rogue, but it worked. Yeah. But anyway, but no, I, I knew, I knew early on in my journey, I wasn't going to be able to do it all on my own. I'd be wasting my time if I thought, okay, I can just do all. And then learn about you. Um, I remember sending you a WhatsApp message 
and I wanted to film with you in December, but it was like, I think it was like the 21st of December. I was like, yeah, do, can, can you do these dates? Yeah, that's right. And I said like, you'd be nuts to film around Christmas time. Yeah. Um, it would be just too hectic. You'd just be li literally getting crowds of people on camera rather than actual uh, in-film footage. Yeah, and that, that for me, because as, as soon as you said that, I was like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Like, <coughs> I, I really don't know what I don't know. It's like, I've proposed some dates. He'd been like, he was like, you're a moron. And I'm like, ah, right, yeah, I've still got so many blind spots in here. And then, yeah, I think that first, that first filming weekend that we did in London, that really just changed the course of my entire life forever. Because when I was actually able to see myself back in full crisp 1080p on the mean streets of London during December, I was like, whoa, I'm so shit. And like at this point, I thought I was so good. I was like, oh, I'm so good at cold approach. Like I'm getting numbers, like, you know, I'm meeting girls, it's all going really well. And then I'm like, as soon as I saw myself on camera, and also I was like, well, when I saw myself on camera, I was like, I'm shit. <laughs> I'm actually shit at this. And yeah, I think that was the biggest turning point for me because I also knew that because we were filming together, it's like you also functioned as a mentor to me as well. Like you were giving me feedback after every approach. You were telling me what was good, what was shit, what I, what I could improve on. At the end of the three days of filming, you're like, yeah, you should probably give it a couple of months until you... Yeah, well, I remember that. I was going to say that, that. Yeah, I remember saying to you, like, look, just have a, a couple more months practice before you uh, uh, jump into the, uh, the coaching uh, scene and, and say that you're the guy that can, can help people with it. Yeah. But I think, if anything, that was a... That was a brilliant thing that you did that you actually did just take more time got more, the extra bit of practice in and then you took that that next step and I think in the long haul I think that made a massive difference for you yeah I agree I think that I've, al I've always liked the idea of applying pressure to myself so it's like once I'd gone to London I would paid you money for the filming and I'd started the YouTube channel and I started posting these in field I was like there's no going back now. Like yeah. I either make it or I end up in some gutter somewhere because it's like, that's just the way, like when I'm saying like, okay, just, just be obsessive about it. And it's like, I don't know. It, it was just, it was important for me to just be like in collaboration with somebody who actually knew what they were doing because it just saved me so much time and so much hassle when I could just watch myself back and I was getting feedback. I was like, I really just, I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and yeah, I think just having having the footage just allowed me to just make lightning progress. Progress I wouldn't have made otherwise. Like, yeah, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't be in Lisbon today if we hadn't done that first weekend together. Yeah. Interesting. Um, what was it like working with your first client? Because I, I would imagine uh, after we'd had that first session, you'd gone away, you got a bit more practice in. Um, and then you open the doors to uh, offering coaching services. What was it like suddenly stepping into the, uh, the world of being a coach, going from the guy who was going out and practicing constantly to now being the guy who was now able to actually teach other guys how to do it? Yeah, I think for me, it was, it was something that I'd expected to do for a long time. Like as soon as I saw that first infield video, I'd already, I'd already prophesized it. I'd already, I was already like, I'd already experienced my future self in advance. I was like, yeah, I know one day I'm going to coach this. But like for me, I, I started off coaching people for free. So I think whenever, whenever young guys want to get into a new venture, the focus is make money as soon as possible. But like, I think, especially in this industry, like you have to really earn your credibility. It's mm -hmm. like just taking it step by step. So yeah, look, my, my first offer when I first started this was, you, you pay for my train ticket, I will come to your city and I will, I will coach you for as long as you want me to. So it's like, that's the obsession part of it. It's like, I didn't care. I just wanted to coach. I just wanted to help people. I just wanted to get experience under my belt. So mm. when people were reaching out to me on my old email address, I didn't have a website, I didn't have anything at this time. I just had infields. I was just a 20, 23 year old kid who had an idea of something that could be successful in the, in the long run. But it's just like, it was just like this notion of delayed gratification. I was like, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be charging people money right now because I don't feel as though I'm actually worth anything at the moment. But I do know I've got a skill and I do know I'm good with people and I do know I can teach this. So yeah, the first experiences with my clients was they paid for my train ticket. So I'd go to like Manchester, Liverpool, Birmingham. And yeah, I just spend time with the guys and I would, 
I, I really went hard with these uh, coaching sessions. Like we would do the session, before the session we'd have like a, a pre-session call just to make sure they were in the right mindset. After we had our session together, we'd have a post-coaching call, they have my WhatsApp number so they, can, they could message me. You know, I, I was doing all of this for free, all of it, because like for me it was like that that's just how this needs to be right now i i just want to i want to learn the skill because i know for me coaching it was it was a lot different i think that there's one thing being good at the skill but it's can you actually teach it mm. and i don't think that for me it was like i need to put as much emphasis on 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 learning how to coach than learning how to call approach with a lot of guys in this industry i think that they got really good at the skill but they don't actually know how to teach. They're not entrepreneurs. They don't know how to run businesses. It's mm -hmm. just like, give me your money. Maybe you'll get results. Maybe you won't. And it's it's just on to the next client. It's just like this like crazy churn rate where there, there's no relationship built with the clients over time. It's like yeah. they do these like stupid like one-off days. Like, oh, change your life in one day. And it's like you you are actually moronic if you sign up for that shit you are actually moronic if you think that you're going to be able <laughs> to master this skill in one day it like dude it's I, I started this whole like personal renaissance odyssey like mastering my social skills at 13 years old 14 years later i've got to a point where i'm like yeah i'm, I'm fucking good at this now but it's like if it took me that long to get there Dude, if you're that, that guy who's working in IT, you're 35 years old, you never had a girlfriend, you've got no chance. No chance of being able to do it all on your own or no chance in, in changing your life in one day. It doesn't work like that. It's like you need, you need sustained support over a long enough time horizon. So that, that was the most important thing for me. It was like once people, and this was me projecting into the future, this time I'm still making no money, but it's like mm. one day I know people are going to pay me a lot of money. So it's like... It's, it's, it's more important to me that these people, they, they, they need to get results as well. Like that's the only focus, that's the only metric we ever need to focus on. If you're a coach or if you're a business owner, if you're running an agency, everyone's so focused on the vanity metrics. How much money am I making? Like what's, what's the revenue this month? Like there, there, there are, there's people, like real people behind those numbers. So it's, for me, my focus is on impact over revenue. Mm. That's the most important metric to focus on. It's, Every single time that I make a video or I do a podcast or I have a conversation like this, I'm creating a piece of content which is going to go out there into the world. The only focus is let's just change people's entire fucking lives with this piece of content. If the focus is impact over revenue, the money will find you. The money will follow you because for me, you're focused on the right metric, which is actually helping people, getting people the results that they want. You can't do it all in a day or a weekend. Like that's good for those big hits of motivation to show yourself that you can do it. But it's like you need you need the accountability. You need the support system. You need the guidance, the encouragement. It's like you don't have those. And that, that that's what I got out of uh, being in collaboration with you for over these four years. It's like we, we've got that constant FaceTime. Yeah, we actually became friends through this. And it's like I think in order to actually achieve results in this cold approach space, mm. it needs to be a long-term vision rather than a short-term hit. Um, that, that's, that's what was important for me anyway. So yeah, to answer your question, I was starting off coaching for free because I knew that what I was learning during those free coaching sessions would benefit not only me, but the future guys who I work with like two, three, four years later. Um, and I would like to think that the work that I put in early I like to think that it's paying off now. Yeah. Did you always have that skill to kind of future proof or future predict where you were, where you saw yourself or, or how you were going to get there? Yeah, I think I have. I don't know if it's sort of been ingrained into me before I came on yeah, to this it, earth, I mean, it's a very but... unique skill to, to have. I mean, it's very, I mean, I mean, I've met hundreds of, of coaches over the years, not just in, in dating, but just in self improvement in general from like all levels and like the full spectrum from like the really logical to the really woo woo and out there but very few people that i've met have that kind of uh motivation and drive and determination to think like okay right this is where i i see myself in the future and all i need to do now is figure out all of those steps in between for me to get there mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me it sounds, I know how narcissistic it sounds, but it's just how no, about, I, how I mean, I think it's more self-actualization. I think people get narcissism and self-actualization uh, kind of muddled or, or blended into one. But 
narcissism is, I, I think, very different to that. You've worked hard for it and you should be proud of yourself. That to me is self-actualization. Narcissism would be like, I've worked hard so now everyone should worship me and, um, and uh, I'm not gonna share this skill unless they, you know, they, uh, well, I suppose they, they pay me for it or, or they just have to just admire the, the level that I'm at now. Uh, mm. And in fact, actually, that's probably where the narcissism side would come in, where actually people like to be worshipped. They like the fact that they are better than people, whereas I think you genuinely like to help people and you want people to get to the same level that you're at. Yeah, I've, I, think, I think I've got both, if I'm, if I'm being completely transparent. I think I've got both. I think that I've got this uh, simultaneous dichotomy working inside of me, which is, where I, which is what... I was, you have, I was you have to bear with me. What, what does dichotomy mean? Oh, was I just uh, <laughs> sorry. Like... You, you're 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 so good with your articulate uh, uh, language that you do use some vocabulary uh, that that's kind of out of my jurisdiction. Let's say, <laughs> let, let's say I've got this, uh, this 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 contrast of different feelings inside of me. Okay. So like okay. I actually so the the the, the thing that I was going to say is like when I was about I was about maybe five four four or five years old. It's one of the it's one of the earliest memories I actually have, and it's so vividly imprinted into me that. I remember it like it's just it's just weird. So I just remember my mum, my mum was was driving me somewhere, and to the left of me was this it was this news agent. It's called the Mace, right? It's just this big blue news agent in the small town that we used to live. And I remember driving. Oh, good. Yeah. I remember driving in the car with my mum. It's like four or five years old. I remember getting hit with this sudden rush of feeling where I felt in that moment that I was special. Like I felt in that moment, and this is like four or five years old, I felt I was better than everybody else. That's what I genuinely felt. I felt as though I was special. I felt as though I was better than everybody else. And like that, that feeling has always stayed with me. So like, I think it would be wrong of me to say now, I, I still have that feeling. Like I have this, this contrast inside of me where at the same time, I think I'm better than everybody else. But at the same time, I feel as though I'm an unlovable piece of shit who's never going to be enough for anybody. So that's where those contrasts of like emotions come into play because if you imagine that, you think that you're better than everybody else, but at the same time, you think you're never going to be worthy, no one's ever going to love you, you're never going to be able to achieve all the things. It's like, it, it creates this weird type of pressure inside of me where I feel as though I always, I always stay hungry. I always want to achieve the best things for myself. And it's like, I think that's the reason why the guys who I work with get the results that they do because they actually become a reflection of me. It's like when they win, I win because I don't want anybody to have worked with me and to have felt disappointed because for a client to have felt disappointed by the service they received, that would feel like my mum being disappointed in me and that really hurts. So I feel as though I've actually got this, this people pleasing aspect to my personality where I actually do want to people please, but it's like, I only want to please the people who matter to me. So mm. it's like, that is, it's just, a, I don't know, I don't know how better to express it, but it's like, that, that's the thing that really motivates me because it's like, I, I don't want to disappoint anybody. Like, I don't want to let people down. It's like when people pay me a lot of money to work with me, it's like I'm just, I'm just working relentlessly like a savage to make sure they get the results that they want because like, if, they, if they lose and I lose, and it's like that doesn't tap in well to my psyche because I'm like, nah, we, when, we, we weren't born to lose. You know, we've been put on this earth for a reason. So yeah, it's, it's, just, an, it's just an interesting feeling that I've got. Um, but I don't know, I feel like that's always been the thing that's, that, that's driven me to want to do more. Because it's like, I mean, I don't know how, how deep you want to go with this, but I was going to talk about the meaning of life. Before we moved, I was about to uh, begin a, an expostulation on the meaning of life. So I thought about this for a long time. And I think when people talk about the meaning of life, like everyone I think has got different definitions to it. But I think that for me, the meaning of life is the fulfillment of a promise. Yeah, so I believe that I've been put on this earth. Before I got put on this earth, I made a pact with God, right? I got put on this earth, I made a pact with God. I can't remember that pact anymore, but it's like, I think the purpose of life is the fulfillment and the remembering of that promise. So I feel as though I've been put on this earth for a reason. And I think the reason is to inspire a generation of men to live a life beyond the beige, yeah? To go after the things that they want rather than selling for what they think they can get. I think ultimately to become great fathers and great masculine role models. So I feel like that's why I'm here. I feel as though for me, whenever I get, whenever I feel 
demotivated or I feel a bit lethargic. I feel as though it's because I'm not in alignment with, with the work that I need to be doing. It's so like in a really practical essence, it's like us being here in Lisbon and making these videos for the past two or three days, like I, I felt so fulfilled in myself. It's like when I was saying before about impact over revenue, I was actually having a conversation with my mum last night. I was like, this is when I'm at my happiest. When I feel my most fulfilled is when I feel as though I'm actually actualizing the truth that I've been put on this earth to do. It's like going out there, I understand that most people watch these videos and they just think, oh, picking up girls, cold approach, day game. But it's like for me, it's always gone so much deeper than that. It's all like, cold approach for me is a catalyst for the rest of my life. I used to think I was confident before I got started with cold approach, but I realized that I just had situational confidence. Without a deck of cards in my hand, I didn't feel confident anymore. So it's like, this really has been the catalyst for everything great that's happened to me. Like, I really have become more confident. I've been able to attract more girls, like the girls I actually wanted. Um, I've been able to make more money. I've been able to build an international lifestyle, but I think it's all stemmed from the fact that I've been able to die bomb into discomfort and do what terrifies me on a daily basis. Mm. Um, but it's, it's just been amazing for me. It's just, I think just, just being out here in Lisbon and making these videos, like this really is where I feel at my, my most fulfilled and my happiest. It's when I'm just, I feel as though I'm doing good work. You know, I feel as though, you know, we put these videos out there, maybe one person watches them and it changes the entire trajectory of their life forever. And it's like, it's deeper than cold approach. It's deeper than day game then. It's like, you're actually changing people's lives. And I don't know, I find that the most fulfilling aspect about doing this. Yeah, no, and I get the impression of that. Uh, I think every time that I do work with you and you've got an idea of what videos you want to make as well. Um, and then even the, the opportunities that I've been around you when you've been working with your clients and I, I hear the, the conversations that you have. Um, you've got very good at giving very good uh, pep talks and motivational speeches uh, to people. Um, I mean, it just sort of like flies off the tongue. Daily, really. life, daily <laughs> live streams, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah the, uh, it, what's the saying? Practice makes perfect. And um, yeah, you've definitely got that down um, to a T. Uh, so, I mean, how do your family feel about things now for you now that you've uh, you know you've you've been doing this for four years you've grown this business to this level you are traveling internationally um, you're helping guys around the world as well what well, what have their reactions been to where you're at now 99% of them I say don't understand it <laughs> okay. um, I think you say 99% absolutely love it but nah I mean look it's all the, the the only the only person's admiration that I need is my mum's. That was that was the biggest deal for me when I started this. Is what was what's my mum going to think of it? Mm. That was a difficult conversation to have because I wasn't quite sure how she was going to react to it when I when I explained what this new vocation was that I wanted to do. I didn't even need to convince her though. Like all 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 she cares about is does this make you happy? And are you helping people by doing this? If the answer is yes, and she's she, she's all for it, but it's like I don't know. I feel like because this is such like a, I think it's like a grey area of society. It's an unorthodox thing, right? Like going out there, call approaching girls. I feel like there's always that social stigma attached to it. But when I had the conversation with my mum, she was like, just just go for it. You know, as, as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as you feel as though you're living in alignment with what you think you should be doing, then I'm I'm happy as long as you're happy. The rest of them, honestly. They can go fuck themselves because the reason why the majority of my family dislike me, the majority of them have, they, they resent me for the life that I'm living now. If they come across my, I don't post on Facebook, but like if they come across my Instagram or something, it's, it's just always negativity. Like, oh, must, must be nice to, to be living your life. Like, oh, we're, we're still here, you know? Like, we still have to go to the shipyard. It's like, oh, you've changed. It's like, yeah, you haven't. And that's why you're bitter. And I know, I know it, it it is a weird dynamic, but it's like, it's normal for me, I'm used to it. But it's like, I think the, the majority of people in my family, they, they don't understand it. And I've got to a place now where I don't, I don't resent them. Like, I don't resent them because like, if I was them, I would hate me as well. Like I would feel exactly the same because like, I think when you are that black sheep who breaks the mold, it's, it is difficult for them to comprehend it mm. because all they know is just small town mentality, wake up 6 a.m., clock in, clock out, have like your couple of holidays a year, have a couple of kids, get a mortgage, die. That's, that's, that's the only tapestry they know is just that. So it's like, yeah, the, 
the, the, the conversation with them, it was like, they just don't get it. Like, if, they, if, if I'm explaining to them, like, this is, this is how I make money, they're like, wait, you can, you can make money that way. Yeah, For, my family is still grappling their heads around eBay. They're still, they're still like amazed that people can sell goods online and make money for it. They just think, oh, it must be illegal. <laughs> okay. so, so yeah, I mean, I didn't, I didn't need the support of them though. The only support I needed was from my mum. And as long as I got her stamp of approval, I think, I think that's another thing that feeds into my motivation as well. It's like, like I just want, I, I just want to be able to like have a conversation with her, and she's just like even though she might not understand it properly, even though it's like, she might disagree with areas of it, she might do, but it's like, I just want, I just want her to feel proud, mm. that's it. It's like, if, if I can go home and speak to her, and it's like, oh mum, you know, I did this, I did that, I did that, and it's like, oh yeah, like, that's really good, like, I'm really proud of you, like, that, that, that's the only thing that matters to me, the rest of them, yeah, fuck them. <laughs> Interesting, yeah, I, I mean, I can kind of relate even to, to some of that. I mean, I, I got, I think before the lockdowns, my business was at like its peak. And, and you know, respectfully for a lot of people and coaches and stuff that, that I knew, you know, a lot of businesses struggled once lockdowns had hit. And I remember uh, even having a, a conversation with, with my dad at like my, my best years and, even he, uh, have you ever seen the movie Catch Me If You Can? Yeah, is that with, uh, with Leo? Leonardo DiCaprio yeah, 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 and Tom yeah, yeah. Hanks? Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Where there's like a scene where he goes to his dad, I think it's played by Christopher Walken, um, and he goes to his dad and he said, Look, Dad, I've made all this money and you know, I, I just want to settle down now, I want to stop running. Yeah. And the dad says, like, No, just keep going why why stop just keep is that going where they're in like the cocktail bar I, I think so it's been a while to be I fair know, since think, i've seen I think it I know the scene. um but I, I think for me like i can relate to your story because i um you know I, even with my dad i've got kind of a, an estranged relationship you know we don't really talk that much um and then and even then i'll have like a lot of arguments with my mum as well i love them a bit but you know they are just of a very different generation they have a very different way of doing things you know, they never understood when I started working in the self-improvement world. When I even started doing self-improvement on myself, they just didn't understand. And even when I got involved in the, the pickup industry and the dating industry in general, it was also just a very difficult conversation to have with them uh, that they just couldn't, you know, wrap their head around. But point being is that with my dad, you know, I, even when I was at my best, when I, I felt like I'd really reached that, that level of self-actualization or just some genuinely good success in my life when younger I'd felt like I just wasn't capable of anything. Um, there he was just saying like, well, that's not good enough, carry on going. And I think, I remember I think in one of those uh, situations that, that, that kind of broke me a little bit because I thought like, well, but I'm, I'm trying and you, you don't really care. So, but as you say, at the end of the day, it's about your happiness and it's about your success. And I realized that after that conversation, this, this was a few years ago as well, to be fair, um, but I realized that, um, that actually, you know what? It didn't matter. I didn't need their opinions and viewpoints on things. It was the fact that one, how did I feel about myself? How was my success? How was I gauging it? And two, was I making a difference for other people? Um, and kind of with like what you said about with your, your meaning of life, I mean, for me, I, I believe I'm, I'm here on, on earth to, to kind of serve people, to help them with their struggles and help them to just be happy, whatever that looks like to them. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's genuinely important to, to have that in mind or just even that consideration of like, well, what, what do I want to do with my life? For the time that I'm here, what do I want to make of it? For some people, if they want to party, then sure. But is that going to benefit the greater good? Not, not really. But that's why I'm, if anything, I mean, I've always, I've said to people, like I, I've always felt, I think that like you are one of, one of the best with it. And, and just with how quickly you accelerated to the level that you got to now, I think it's incredibly uh, commendable, just, you know, that you threw yourself into the deep end. And even with the hardship that you had, 
uh, on your own in your own time because I, I was sort of aware over the years anyway like you had stuff going on and, and you know and I'm one of those people I don't tend to pry which is why you know being able to do a podcast thing is a great way to to at least flush out uh, an understanding of things um, but you know I'd, I'd always kind of had the awareness of you know that you had stuff going on and you you were really trying your hardest to make it work and I think even for yourself, the lockdowns kind of ruined the, the, the magic side of your, your business as well, didn't it? So, you know, it, it, it really was hard for everyone, but you were determined, you had that, that sheer willpower to, to give it a go. And, and, uh, and I, I kind of knew a little bit about that you were traveling the country to go and practice in different places, but uh, I don't think I knew about that you were traveling to uh, work with people for free as long as they paid for your your ticket and stuff and I think that just shows the the dedication and, and admiration that you've you've done with it uh, I mean I've known coaches who have dedicated all their business and all their their editing and and all their filming and stuff to me because uh, I know I, I've been the one running their businesses over the years but I, I think the one thing that I've always really had respect for you for was the fact that you did it yourself you know, you never really turned around to me and said, Daniel, can you edit, edit the videos afterwards? You were like, no, I want to I wanna sit, I want to give it a go, I want to learn how to do it. And I want to, you know, create my own interpretation and style of a video that, that's in comparison to everyone else. And of course, that, if I'm doing everyone else's videos, then it's, it's nice for me to see something that, that's, that's a bit different. Um, and I, so I always thought that that was very commendable of you to, to, to try and do that and, and also, I don't know any other coaches as well that would have done that sort of thing that, that you did with, you know, traveling ab abroad to help guys out, um, you know, especially starting off for free and stuff. And, and I think you should be really proud of yourself for that. You know, I mean, absolutely, I can get like why your mum would be 100% behind everything that you're doing. And I feel I think that's it's, it's really fantastic that in four years, you've done stuff that I know has probably taken people maybe like six or eight years to, to kind of do, and you've done that literally on your own. Um, so if anything, I mean, ne next thing that I'd love to hear about is the, I suppose, the kind of uh, clients that you work with and then the kind of successes that they've had as well. I mean, I, I've, I've certainly got an idea, and, and I think even guys watching it as well, have because uh, you've, you've said it already, like the kind of guys that you've worked with and the kind of situations that they've had, but I'd love to know maybe uh, a couple of stories, um, if you can recall them. Although I'm pretty certain you probably can recall them because, you, you're, again, you're so quick on the ball. Um, but, I mean, I, yeah, I'd love to know um, what have been some of your favourite success stories uh, from clients and maybe some great stories that you've had whilst you've been travelling with them. Yeah, I mean, I always say to people, my best client result has been myself. Yeah. Like, I, I really would say that I'm my best case study because I think what makes the stuff that I've done more unique than anybody else is I was documenting very early on. Yeah. I, and I've pointed that out to people as well. Um, like, when I've, I've had, even when, like, in your early days whilst we were working together and then even when you did start to, to go and travel um, and people have said, like, oh, have you got any recommendations of, of people who've got that kind of transformation thing going on and I've said well check out Christian I mean you, I think uh, you put your first video out on on your YouTube channel that was like I don't know what I'm gonna do but I'm, I'm gonna figure it out and you know and and you had like your you like a like a beard oh, thing yes. going on oh, and yes. uh, I don't know if you had different glasses or not but you certainly had a different hairstyle going on there as well but um, but yeah but no I, I agree um, I think you've certainly been a uh, a great um, example, but no, I want to. I want to hear about like your clients, not not you, because I, I think you've you've absolutely proved over the last four years that you are a, a great definition of what happens if you really work hard towards something and you commit to it, and if you really really want it, not not having a half assed uh, decision of like, yeah, I want it, but I'll I'll do it later. It's like no, I'm going to do it now. This is how you do it. So, um, so no, no I, I would. I'd love to hear some of the stories of, of, of your clients. Yeah, I think the first one's probably George. You know, like, you've met him. He yep. was, uh, he's one of the first people who came forward and one of the first people who actually paid me. Um, can't remember how much it was, about 100 quid. <laughs> he got in early, that guy. <laughs> and everyone else is now like, oh, I wish I'd have been able well, to have got in that, that early. He got in, he got in early, my yeah. early, early adopters, right? If you're like, you know, if you're early to things and you get a good deal, but... No, I think the, the beautiful thing with, with, with George is that 
as soon as we met up for our first ever session in London, I just knew it, it immediately that we were going to be friends forever. Like just, I just knew. You just like got we that just, vibe. We just got on. Yeah. And like, I think that's some of the best relationships that I've formed since starting Cold Approach. I've actually been with the clients as opposed to the women, which I never actually thought would be true. But it's like the, the, the brotherhood that I've got, you know, it's like the, the people that I've met, because for me, it's like Cold Approach has been a way to satiate the social and the romantic needs. But it's like, I never actually understood the importance of having a good masculine support network around me until I started coaching. So yeah, I think George would be the first person that I would, I would, I would shout about like when he first came uh, to work with me. He was in a he was in a difficult position. Like he just come out of a relationship. He got messed around a little bit with a girl that he was seeing. He knew about this space for a long time. He just never took action. He was always anxious about it. He felt resistant. And also, he never actually found anybody who resonated with him to the level that I resonated with him. Like too. So as soon as he saw my videos, I remember. I was walking through Leeds at the time and then I had an email come through and this was like one of the first times I had an email come through where someone was actually willing uh, to pay me. I was like, well, this is strange. What, like, what, what was that feeling like? Was it, were you kind of like over the moon or? Uh... It was almost like, um, I, I think the feeling was like, oh, like, I almost felt relieved. I think that's probably the best way that I can describe it. Like, I, I, felt, I felt happy, but I felt relieved. So I felt as though like that was the first indicator that I had that I could actually make money doing this. So it was like, it was relief, I think. Um, but I got that email through and he was like, oh, hey, bro, like, sorry to bother you on a Sunday. I'm not sure if you're going to read this. I'm not sure if you're going to respond to it. It's like, dude, I ain't that high value right now. Like, I'm, probably, I'm, I'm, gonna I'm, I'm gonna be responding to this email. That's like the only email that I've seen in my Gmail for the past two months. I'm gonna respond to it. Um, anyway, so he just kind of like, he shared a story, like who he was, what he wanted to get out of this whole thing. He explained to me that money was tight at the moment. So the stars just aligned. Like I do believe that on this earth, there are people who, we are, who we're just meant to meet, both men and women. And I think it's like, for the way that I operate my life is, is I want to attract my people and repel the rest. It's like everyone who comes forward to work with me now, it's like, yeah, we were always meant to meet, men, man or woman. So, but yeah, he, he got in contact with me. He wasn't in the best place uh, mentally, financially, spiritually, but he knew that he wanted to get started. And I really liked him for that. It's like, he just wanted to get started. And I could tell from the way that he sent that first email that he was committed to changing. So yeah, we had our first session together in London. Um, and then I remember I said to him, Okay, first session, yeah, we completed that. I was like, I would really love to do a follow-up session with you. I don't want you, and he can verify this, I don't want you to pay me for the second session. Just book my train ticket to London, and we'll do a second session. Because I actually really wanted to go to London again. Like, I was like, I was loving London at the time. So I was like, ha, huh, I can get him to pay for my train ticket. I wasn't even like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, I wasn't bothered about trying to like milk milk George for like a shit ton of money. That, that wasn't what this was. I was like, I found a human being who I genuinely know I can help. When he becomes successful, this is like the future projection again. Like I was already thinking like, dude, one day we can make videos together. One day he's gonna give me incredible testimonials. Like, so this is the way that I'm thinking because like a rising tide lifts all the boats. When my clients win, I win, right? So this that's the way that I strategize. So it's like, I had that first session with him. We did the second session together. And then we actually used to have calls. We used to call each other every single Tuesday for about six months after that uh, second session. We just used to check in with each other every single Tuesday. We just talked um, and it was nice. And we just, we, we formed a relationship that way. And then fast forward to today, he's in a long-term relationship with an amazing girl. He met her through Call Approach in, by the bus station. And like, he, he really is one of my best, one of my best poster boys for what I'm doing now. And I think that, I remember it was, it was your birthday when we went to Brewdog, yeah? And, and do you remember like, I, I remember what you said to me, it was like, we were all sat around a table. There was about like, maybe like eight, nine, 10 of my clients. Like we're all sat around a table, mm. you were there. And George's girlfriend was there as well. She was the only female in this group. Like it was me, like the coach, Daniel's there. And then the rest of the table, are my clients and I remember you said to me how how lovely it was that George could bring his girlfriend who he met through cold approach yeah. to actually meet all of us do you know what I mean because I like that social stigma which is attached to all of this it's yeah. like he'd actually felt as though we, we felt very comfortable with it I mean because I, I think I'd said like you wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't believe that uh, a guy would be so comfortable bringing his girlfriend in front of a load of other like guys, uh, guys who've, who've, who are into trying to, trying to street approach. Yeah, and I just thought that that was an amazing moment for me. And then now it's like, we're all friends. So like when I go mm. to London, 
we all meet up, we go out, we have some like deep, meaningful chats together. And it's just like, I, I, like you know, when, when they get married, it's like, it's just the part of me is like, yeah, I, 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 helped, I helped assist this. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, I don't know, it just, it just feels nice to me because it's like, when I can actually see the result in front of me, I can see how happy George is. I can see how amazing and strong this relationship is. And it's like, that really, it's just so difficult to actually put that into words, like how important that is, because it's almost just like, a, it's, it's like, I think it's, it satiates the 13 year old kid inside of me who, wants to make friends, he wants to feel important, he wants to feel as though his presence actually means something to somebody. If I can see George with his girlfriend, I'm like, yeah, part of me made this happen. That just makes me feel so good. And it's like, it satiates that 13 year old kid inside of me. So I think that's really nice. I think George is the first one. Um, the next one that I would say is probably uh, Ephraim, who you've probably seen him on videos. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, a similar situation. Like he kind of knew about, known about this world for a long time. Everyone was an interesting case study though, because he actually had everything going for him on paper. Like he was actually he was making great money. He had a remote job programming. Um, he looked really good, so he'd actually transformed himself. Like he, everything on paper was great. Mm. The only problem with him is that he just didn't have the belief that he could approach women during the day. And I think Ephraim really elucidates the importance of permission in this space. Ephraim actually had all of the skills. So he'd worked in sales. So he already understood the process to a degree, yeah. very much like with me doing magic. It was kind of similar, right? Mm. You're putting out invitations, you're gonna get people who are really into your product, other people who don't really care about it, other people are on the fence. Yeah. Well, you become, I think, a bit more desensitized to rejections. Uh, That's fair. So, yeah. um, but I think the, the main thing that was lacking for him was a sense of permission. Like he needed to be with somebody who gave him permission to do the thing that he wanted to do. And tell him that it was okay. And tell him that it was okay. Right. And actually also lead him by example as well, because it's, it's different. Like if you're just watching videos at the moment, I believe videos are not enough to give you permission. When you see somebody in real life do the thing that you want to do, that's worth a million videos, right? It really is because like, as soon as you see someone, first person perspective, it shatters your entire reality. And then, yeah, we worked together in Warsaw last year. Like, I mean, I'll like, he's got his, it, I think that's probably one of the best uh, case studies. Like, the guy's got now got a cold approach YouTube channel. <laughs> you know, he's like, he went from not being able to approach, spent some time with me in Warsaw. He's now one of my best friends. We literally traveled together. He was in Cyprus with me at the start of this year. And that's what I'm talking about as well. Like, this is how, for any of you fucking moron coaches who are watching this, who claim to be coaches, you're all morons, so shut up. The, the way you get results in this is by nurturing relationships with people. So it's like, when I go to a city, it's like, hey, who wants to join me? Let's go, let's go. Like more transformation, more crazy adventures. That's how it needs to be. It's, it's, it's sustained support over a prolonged period. I think actually building relationships and, and becoming friends with the people who you're working with, like that's, that's the most important aspect for me. Um, but yeah, the way, from where he started to where he's at now, it's just crazy. It's night and day. Because I remember that very first day we had together in Warsaw mm. and he was absolutely shitting it. Like so scared and so nervous. Um, but yeah, like, I'm, I'm so proud of him for everything that he's done because yeah, it's one thing to learn this skill, but then to actually go out into, on, like he went back to the States and he started making his own cold approach videos. He started creating like advice videos. Like, he's actually a credible source of information as well because he's actually, he's actually done the thing he teaches on his channel. And it's like, yeah, I just think that's a remarkable transformation uh, in a relatively short space of time as well. So that's a really cool one. Do you want any more? Yeah, go on, give me one right, more. one more. I, I won't use the guy. Round it, to round it as three, yeah. Fine. I won't use the guy's real name because I think he would prefer anonymity. But we'll call him, uh, we'll call him John. <laughs> so I remember, you've met John actually, but anyway. John. You, you can tell me afterwards. Yeah, okay. John, is, yeah. John, John worked with me uh, in London last summer. Right, and I remember, this is interesting actually, because during the first coaching day, it was me and George who were coaching him. Right, so George had like done coaching for me. Like George has always been a great, George has always been great with people. So I was like, George, come along to this. You'll be able to help out John with his first day. Um, so John was in an interesting position because he'd come out of a long-term relationship. So he'd been in a 10-year long-term relationship. He met this, he met his other half uh, down the pub. And then he had a couple of kids with her as well. That relationship ended. He re-entered the dating market and the dating market was now a lot different. 
to how it was 10 years ago. Mm. Now we have social media. Now we have dating apps. Yeah. Now we have um, the rise of the internet and hyper-digitalization. It's not as easy anymore just going down the pub and meeting the woman you're going to spend the rest of your life with. So he was in a bit of a, a sticky patch. Like he, was, he was genuinely depressed. Mm. Like he was genuinely at his rock bottom when he reached out to me. It was actually when I was coaching Ephraim out in Warsaw. I had a consultation call with him. And I said to him, what do you want? Like, what do you actually want to get from this process? And he said, well, look, I really, I really want to build, I, I want to feel confident. You know, I want to feel confident. And yeah, it'd be nice if I could date. And I was like, dude, shut up. Just like, cut the bullshit. Like, what, what do you actually want? And like, the, basically, this is what I try and get people to do because it's never the surface level answer. People usually have two reasons for doing something, the public reason, the private reason. What I want to try and do when people apply to work with me is find the private reason. Like, why are we really doing this? So like the deeper that I dug, what I realized was what he was really saying to me and then what I coaxed out of him, which I need him to be able to say is, I'm lonely, I'm lonely, I'm depressed. I don't know if I'm actually going to be able to be worthy for another human being. And that's making me feel really scared and unworthy in myself. So that's why he was reaching out to me. It wasn't because he wants to learn cold approach or become a little bit more confident or date a few more girls. It's because he was at his rock bottom. He felt lonely, he felt depressed, and he actually didn't know what the fuck to do. So like, that, that was important for me because it's like, right, we know why we're here now. But yeah, that first day, the first day that myself and George were coaching him in London, it was pissing it down with rain. Met up with him outside the Boots, you know, the one in uh, Trafalgar Square. Oh, no, right. Uh, Traf yeah, yeah, Trafalgar Square. Yeah. Uh, we met him out there. I was like, John, how are you doing? He was like, oh, mate, I'm so depressed. I was like, this is going to go fucking well. So, <laughs> so he did about... What a great introduction. Awful. And he was dressed terribly. All right? He'll laugh about this now because I know he actually watches these videos still. Appreciate you. Um, he dressed terribly. He had like this fucking like, I don't even know what to describe it as. It was just like a, a cagoule. <laughs> so, I'm going to have to Google. What, 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 it's like what, a what waterproof jacket. Okay. <laughs> but it made him look like a moron. <laughs> and it's like, it just looked terrible. He did about five approaches and they were all shit, right? And it was it was probably the worst coaching day I've ever had since I started. Uh, I, took, <laughs> I took him to a Cafe Nero and we sat down. I said, George, you give him your feedback first. And George was like, you know, being positive. Like, oh, you did this well. Anyway, so George Fish, I just said, to, I remember just looking at him, I said, right, first of all, I, I, I hit the table. I was like, first of all, you need to fucking dress better. <laughs> I remember saying to him, you look like you've just come off of the peasant bus. You look like you just come off of the fucking peasant bus. <laughs> he had so much money and he was dressed terribly, right? So I was like, you need to fucking dress better. So I gave him my feedback, which was just like, no bullshit, no nonsense. I told him what he needed to know rather than what he wanted to hear. I genuinely didn't think I would see him ever again. Because I, I left that and I was like, yeah, maybe we were actually a little bit too hard on him there. Like, I just gave it to him straight. I wasn't expecting to see him the second day. I was expecting to get a message from him being like, Soz, mate, this isn't for me anymore. You're a prick. I'm not going to, uh, don't want to like, work with you anymore. He came back the second day and it was complete night and day. He had a, a button down shirt on. He had a new pair of jeans on, new pair of shoes. He looks like a completely different man. And he was like, before we even do any approaches today, I just want to say thank you so much because that's the first time in a long time where someone has just been brutally honest with me because he hadn't had that for a long time. Like he's, he's got his own business, he's making great money, he had his family, like no one has actually told him for a long time, you're shit and you actually need to make some serious changes if you're serious about changing. Um, so completely different guy on the second day. Second day was so much better. The third day he started getting phone numbers, started to get more confident um, and then six months after we worked together, he eventually got himself, he's, he's now in, a long-term relationship with a woman who's seven years younger than him. She's just now officially moved in with him. Wow. And his life has genuinely never been better. And I remember meeting up with him. This was before um, he made this girl official. But I remember meeting back up with him in London about maybe a couple of months after we did our in-person immersion together. I remember I was, he was walking with me because I was going to go on a date with this woman in, I can't remember where it was, around Knightsbridge area. So he's walking with me uh, to the date. And we got to like the little point where it's time for us to go our separate ways. And he just turned to me and he was just like, thank you so much. You have genuinely changed my life. And there's no more, like there's nothing else I can, like that's, that's the best way that I can express it. He's like, if you ever need anything, tell me and it's done, right? And it's like, just, I think there's a certain relationship which, is, which has been formed. I guess it's like, 
maybe like guys that you go to war with would be similar. I don't know. I never experienced that. But I think there is a certain relationship which is formed with uh, guys, like a, like a brotherhood. You mean? Yeah, yeah with yeah. guys who call approach. You really yeah, feel I, as I know. It, I know it. Yeah, because I've spend, heard a similar thing. With yeah, them. like you spent time in the trenches together, and it's like the guys, the guys who I coach, the guys in my network, they know we can talk about anything. Like I've had conversations with guys in my network and they've, they've told me a story or they've told me an experience or they've told me about something that maybe happened to them in their childhood or a previous relationship. And it's almost like for a couple of minutes, they're in this trance because they feel as though they have permission to speak. And it's like, they'll, they'll, always, they'll always end the story. It's same thing every time. They'll end the story and it's like something switches in their mind. They say, oh shit, I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I said that. It's like, the, the, the reason why you're able to say is because you feel as though you can. Like you're in a safe environment where you feel as though you're not going to get judged. You're not going to get judged for it, which is true. Mm. So it's like there is just something about being part of a brotherhood of like-minded guys who've all been through shit. I think that's the important thing. It's like when you when I hear another guy say something like, "Oh, you know, this is something that I used to struggle with," or oh, "I really used to struggle with that as well." Oh my god, me too. It's like my mum goes to these uh, counselling sessions like every single week because. My mum my has had uh, struggles with her mental health over, over the years. So by having conversations with me, I was like, you know, you should really think and, and consider going to some sort of counselling or, or therapy groups, not just like one-on-one, -on -one, but like group things. Mm -hmm. And she was always like, oh, I don't know. Like, I, She basically had approach anxiety. I was like, no, listen, mum, like, the only thing that's scary right now, it's, it's the anticipation of the bang rather than the bang itself. I know that sounds wrong, but it's like, it's like, a, like, a, like, a, like a firework going off, right? Yeah. It's not actually the firework going yeah, off, it's of like the, the anticipation. So it's like, all, all you need to do, as soon as you get yourself to that group and you open the door, all of your anxieties will dissipate, I promise, yeah? Anyway, she did it and now she's going every week, but she explained to me what she really gets out of these group therapy sessions is knowing that she's not the only person that feels that way. That, that's the main thing. And like when she said that to me, it, it reiterated what I'm doing with my group. Because I think, to be honest, I think the group that I run, it, it is like a men's mental health group as well. It's like, because there's so many guys in there, like high level guys who you'd imagine, yeah, these guys don't struggle with anything. They, they're, they're, they're paragons of perfection, no struggles, no flaws, no nothing. But it's like, when you actually get to know them and you provide them with a safe space to actually vocalize their fears and their anxieties and their depression, it's like, Oh shit, like yeah, everyone, everyone's actually going through things. I think oftentimes people just need somebody to listen. Yeah. Yeah, and just to have that support as well. Um, yeah. I think when uh, you've got guys who grow up and they've just either been in isolation or they've not had someone that they can rely on, even if, whether it be a friend or a family member or whatever, um, yeah, they, uh, they tend to just hold things in. So, I mean, it's great that you've been able to offer that that support as well and I think it kind of reflects in the results that your clients have been getting that they've been able to depend on you and you be honest with them and uh, and help them with their struggles and if you say that something needs to change and uh, they get on and they do it and and you're there every step of the way with them to to help them with that so I think that is really good yeah I think I think it's important for me as well and this is this is not said as like a, as, as, a, as a sales ploy or a, a, like a marketing thing. It's, it's, it is genuinely true, which is I, I genuinely don't work with everybody who gets in contact with me. And the reason being is not every person who contacts me is the right fit to actually work with me. Like I would never work with anybody who I wouldn't be friends with outside of this. I think that's what a mistake I see with a lot of coaches, not just in this space, but any space, is they'll just work with anybody. Anybody who's willing to pay, they're willing to coach. And I think that's a mistake because a bad client can never become a good client. And that's why during that initial consultation, that's as much for my benefit as it is to theirs because I need to find out if, first of all, I think I can actually help this person. Do I really want to be associated with them? And do I really want to have an entire year that we're gonna be working together. Mm. And if the answer to that is no, then I won't work with them. Like I had a conversation, it was just before I left Bangkok, and it was a guy, he got on the phone to me, and he's eight, he was 18 years old, right? He was 18, and he wanted to join the network, he wanted to get coached by me. I was like, dude, like, I could take your money, but you're just not ready for this right now. You're just not ready for it. So like, I gave him a blueprint of what I would do, uh, where he's at in his life right now. I was like, dude, like, maybe 
five years from now, six, seven years, like if you feel as though now you're in a position, then, then reach out to me. But I could just felt, I just felt in that moment that he just had the utmost respect to like, for me. Cause he was like, oh yeah, you know, he, he could have actually sold me some bullshit course. He could have tried to get me on some like bullshit retainer. Like, oh, you pay me this much. It's like, mm. like just try like, try, like trying, trying to like weed a sale out of everybody. And I was like, dude, I ain't gonna try and sell you anything. That was literally what I said to him. I was like, I, I ain't gonna try and sell you anything. You're not ready for this right now. Here's what I would do if I was in your position. Uh, and feel free to drop me a, a WhatsApp message. Maybe it's a decade from now. And then, and then, and then maybe we can talk. But. I just think that's an important thing because like... Yeah, honesty is always a very important thing in any sort of relationship that you have with someone, whether it be a friend or yeah, definitely with a client, so yeah. Because you've just got an expensive headache otherwise. Mm. I've just got an expensive headache. You know, if a guy has invested a lot of money into me and in my head I'm like, I genuinely can't get this guy results. It's like, it's just vanity metrics. Oh yeah, you might have made a lot of money, but you've got, you're, you're gonna have zero impact. The guy's probably gonna hate you. Yeah, He's gonna, more drama out more there drama. Than, He's gonna uh, leave than that's necessary. Bad, so bad yeah. review, bad testimonial, reputations, everything in this industry. So I wanna guard that, like my life depends on it. So I ain't gonna work with anybody who I genuinely don't feel as though they can get results. And that's why I think the highest compliment I can pay to anybody is if I say yes to you, your life is going to change forever because you've got me in your corner, not just me, but the rest of the guys. But I think mm. having me in your corner, it's like from everything that I've explained, like hopefully you can like get the impression out of it. Like you will get to where you want to be. Like it would be unreasonable. As long as you do everything that I tell you to do and you're 100% committed, this works as long as you do. Right? It would be unreasonable for you not to succeed as long as you actually follow the advice that I give you. Because again, evidence has got the loudest voice. You can listen to all the testimonials. Like you will get the results that you want, but it's like you need to be in that position where you're ready to get them. And if you're not, that's fine, I'll tell you. So what's next for you? I'm curious to know, because you've, you've, you've spent the last four years working on your business, you've grown it to such a fantastic level now, you're getting great results with your clients, you're able to travel around the world. So yeah, what, as we're kind of coming towards the end of the podcast, what's next for you? What, what kind of your future plans for the next few years and I'm sure you've definitely got something in mind because I know just how you're you love to future predict so or future plan things so what's what's next yeah I'm finding more and more that my interests are transforming into because with everything that I do I see it as everything that I've done in my life it's always been a precursor it's always been a stepping stone to the next thing so it was never about magic. Magic was the thing that allowed me to get here. So now I'm coaching cold approach. It won't be about cold approach. I'll be doing cold approach right now and that'll lead on to the next venture. So I honestly think, what, and what I hadn't realized for a long time was I basically built the business that I'm running now from absolute nothing, like ground zero. Yeah, I started at 24 pound 82 of universal credit in my bank. Right? I literally had no money, like all on the earliest videos. So it's like, from where I was to where I'm at now, I think I'm living a lifestyle that most men would give the right arm for, right? Being able to live internationally, have a lot of the skill set to approach women, like dating handled, relationships handled, community handled. So it's like, I, I understand that I've got skill and I've got, I've got experience to share. So I think, to answer your question, I would really love, and this is the, the direction I think I will go, I wanna help people build brands online. I want to be able to help guys make money from doing the thing that they love doing. Like I really, because this is something that I'm helping the guys in my entourage, which is my private network. This is something that I help them do, right? When they join, it's like Ephraim, for example, his YouTube channel. Like part of our Warsaw experience was I actually helped him understand personal branding. Now he's got a YouTube channel. Now he's got how many subscribers that he's got. Now he's making videos. So it's like. I've got expertise in, a, in an area which I actually hadn't even realized I had expertise in. So I would really love, once I've got to the end, like once I feel as though my shelf life has expired with cold approach coaching, I really wanna help people make money. I really wanna help people build brands online, like lucrative powerhouse, like luxury personal brands. Like I'm obsessed with luxury brands like like uh, Chanel, for example. It's like, what, like, you know, you, you gave me that book, which was, or you recommend the book, which is uh, oversubscribed. Oh, what, by Daniel Priestley? By Daniel Priestley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's yeah. like, it, it looks into the psychology of money. Like, why do people pay tens of thousands of dollars for a Chanel bag, right? And it's like, because other people want it. Yeah, people desire what other people desire. So, like, I, I became fascinated by luxury brands. Like, how can, if you've got a million people selling sunglasses why is one brand able to charge like a thousand x more and it's like i think it's because they think they deserve it it's because they position themselves in a certain way mm. so like i i, I want to be able to help people unlock that mindset because i think 
there are a lot of people, I think, in the world who are struggling because they don't think it's possible. They like, don't think it's possible for them. Like, oh, I would never be able to do that. I'm, I'm no good on camera. I don't know how to make videos. I don't know how to edit. I don't know how to like do copy. Like, I didn't know any of this shit. Like, I, I did not know anything. I've learned, like, the amount of skills that I've stacked since doing Cold Approach, like, Cold Approach is, like, one of the skills that I've learned. I've learned, like, a plethora, uh, 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 like, a, a multitude of skills since I started this, which, which I didn't even realize. Like you say, like, you know, video editing, content marketing, how to talk to a camera, uh, copywriting, sales, marketing, just, like, personal branding. So it's, like, all of these skills I want to amalgamate into like an offer, a business. And I want to be able to help people build their own brand so they can travel the world, they can make the money that they want to make, explore their income, take care of the family. I do believe that we owe it to the people that we love to become wealthy. I think a lot of times people, I used to think money was evil. I used to think people with money were these like evil, greedy people. And like, it's just, a, it's the programming. Like, I think we're all brainwashed to a degree. But it's like, money's not evil, right? Money gives you the purchasing power to be able to unlock the life that we want. So yeah, I think that's how I see my personal career mapping out over the next 10 years. I will be doing this cold approaching, coaching what I'm doing now. I'll, I'll be doing that for a long time. But I think when I get bored of this, I wanna help people make money. I wanna help people build per personal brands that they're proud of uh, and they wanna share with the rest of the world. Well, if anything, I mean, it's been fantastic watching you go from, uh, from being a turnip uh, to, to, to a grown turnip. <laughs> blossoming. Yeah, you're blossoming turnip, maybe. I don't know what, I, I don't know what the adult form of a turnip is. I don't know. It, it sounds more like a Pokemon when you say the adult form of it. <laughs> but but I, I think, it, I mean, it has. It's, I mean, it's been an absolute pleasure to kind of watch you where you started off and for where you've got yourself four years later. You know, I mean, every coach that always came to work with me, I mean, I never knew where their future kind of lied with it. Um, but it was always amazing for me over the years with every coach just seeing how they kind of developed and evolved and where things did take them because they were putting themselves out there and giving themselves as many of the greatest opportunities that they possibly could and I think for yourself you've done absolute wonders with uh, every opportunity that, that I think you've taken. So I think just before we wrap up um, one thing that I definitely want to try and bring into every podcast is a final message. So if you had a final message for guys who are watching this, who are maybe on the fence about maybe working on their anxiety, whether they've been just introduced to this idea of this world that they can actually do something about it, or maybe they've been in it for a while and they've been stuck, what final thoughts would you share with them? Yeah, it's interesting. I think you could ask me that question on 50 different days and I'd give 50 different answers. But I think one of the things that I was, uh, I heard the other day and it really resonated with me. So I hope it resonates with the people here. I used to believe in like the whole, like follow your why. Yeah, find your why, find your reason for being and do that. I think that's useful. But then someone reframed it and they were like, why not instead follow your why not? Like, why not? Because it's like, one of my mantras is don't die with your music still inside of you. Yeah, like don't get, I don't want to get to the end of my life looking back at the dusty recesses of my existence and being like, you know what? I wish I'd have done more. I wish I wouldn't have cared so much about what other people thought of me. I wish I'd have actually just gone after what I wanted rather than what other people wanted me to do. So I think just that having this why not mentality, like why not you? Like why not get started with cold approach? Why not try and make money? Why not try and elevate yourself? Like there isn't anything actually stopping any of us. I think oftentimes it's just freeing ourselves from the bullshit that we've ingested, whether that's bullshit from your family, the media, or probably even yourself, probably all, your, your own self-limiting beliefs. But yeah, I think the energy that I'm starting to move with more and more now is, yeah, why not? Yeah, like what, what, what's stopping me? Oh, you wanna, you wanna, you wanna help people build personal brand? Oh, why not? Oh, you wanna master call approach? Why not? You wanna, you wanna travel? You wanna live internationally? You wanna be able to take care of your money? It's like, yeah, why not? Oh, I think like I think most guys today they're just they're just crushingly cruel commentators of themselves. As soon as they have an idea of something they want to do, they think of all the reasons why it's going to fail or why they can't do it or why that why why they're not worthy of doing that thing. I'm just like, why not? I think just being able to ask ourselves that question every day. It's like you want to go and approach that girl. You want to start that business. You want to make that video. You want to ask for that promotion. You want to jump into the swimming pool because you almost drowned as a child. Now you're really scared of water. Like why not? You know, like worst case scenario, you learn something, you develop. 
But yeah, I think these days it's selection paralysis. There's so many things that you could do that people just don't do anything. And it's easy to just watch other people's lives, uh, criticize other people for following their bliss and speaking their truth. And it's like, maybe you should just have that why not mentality a little bit more, like why not you? Um, I think if you move with that energy every single day, then yeah, you'll, you'll probably get to where you want to be. But yeah, I think just, just follow your why not rather than your why. I think that would be the message that I would leave people with uh, on this particular podcast. But if you ask me that question another day, I might just say like- Be a different uh, answer. Yeah, it might be like candy floss, yeah. No, well, I, I think that's a great, great answer anyway. And um, an absolute pleasure at least knowing you for the last four years. Well, I'm and, Yeah. <laughs> I'll get, I'll get the rose out. <laughs> no, but I, I, as I say, I, I think it's been absolutely fantastic watching you kind of like grow and evolve over the years and, and, uh, and get to where you are now. And, and, and I, I'm, I'm confident certainly you're, you're leading the way with uh, what the industry needs results wise and the fact that you're changing guys' results. I mean, for me, that's always been like the most important thing. So, um, so no, I'm, I'm, I, I certainly wish you all the best with, with these future plans and stuff that you've got as well. Don't worry, I'll, I'll, I'll write the, uh, is it the obituary that way? Obituary, someone, yes. When yeah, when, when away, someone dies. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I'll, I'll at least... Uh, as long as the phrase, <laughs> as long as I say free from bullshit's in there, I'll be happy. Yeah. Just, you lived a life free from bullshit. Leave it like that. I don't need anything else. <laughs> Very well It'll, said. That'll be cheaper as well because I think they charge you per letter. So if you, if you have, if you, <laughs> my name's really. I'll, I'll be a cheapskate. Uh, yeah, as long as it just, doesn't cost me more than like twenty quid. <laughs> just put FFB. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure I can like abbreviate some stuff with like numbers and things as well. So that you might put hashtag big man ting. Big man ting. <laughs> Big bad thing, bro. <laughs> I'll, see, I'll see what I can do. I mean, we've got, hopefully we've got many years touch with you being alive I and, and helping me. I love that's made of wood. I, well, we'll pretend it's made of wood. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's meant to be a metaphor for it. Okay, fine. Um, but guys, thank you so much for watching. I really hope that you got a lot out of this. Uh, I wanted for a long while, uh, as Christian will tell you, that I really wanted to be able to flush out his story more. And, uh, and hopefully you can see why so many guys have been working with him over the years and been getting such fantastic results. So if you haven't checked out Christian's channel already, by all means, please do. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Look forward to more podcasts that I'll do in future. And of course, I will try and schmooze Christian to take me on another holiday destination. So I can do filming in, in hopefully somewhere else that I can get a, a nice tan from. But other than that- We're going to Colchester next. Yeah, we're gonna do Colchester next. We'll go to or the Romford. zoo. No, that's down the road from me. I don't really want to do do Romford. Oh, fuck you then. Yeah, I, I, where I am, that's that's literally down the road. But but no, thank you very much for watching, and look forward to more podcasts from me in the future, and also videos that I'll be doing with Christian too.